Hello everyone, my name is Caroline Brennan and you're listening to a new series that's coming your way called Journeys. Now today I have the absolute honour of speaking to somebody that has been described to me as a person with a wicked sense of humour and I think that will become obvious the more you listen to this interview. Also, she is somebody who, and I don't mean this in a bad way, who could talk the hind legs of a horse. But to top all that, this lady who is from the Dublin 15 area, is the oldest citizen in Clonsilla. And her name is Elizabeth Farnan. And I began by asking Elizabeth, what age was she? 89 years, the 18th of March. Born in 1916 in the Rotunda Hospital. How many years did you actually stay in school? Until I was 14. 14 years old, yes. Made my first communion. Didn't make my confirmation in Portstown because it was only a chapel at Eves. We had to go to Blanchestown to make our confirmation. And we used to have great fun. We used to cross the fields over with the lads and all. We great fun crossing the fields to Blanchestown to rehearse for confirmation. Mm-hmm. And before confirmation, you mentioned Holy Communion. Was it a huge big ordeal with all the girls and the boys making their Holy Communion? Uh, there was, but it, there wasn't many of us. There was... Um, Five, I think, only at a time, and a couple of them got uh, measles and couldn't go that day and had to wait for them to get better. And still, there was only five of us there in the end, you know, three girls and two boys. And, and can you remember as to what, what kind of clothes did you wear? Did you wear the same type of thing that the little girls wear these days, you know, the long white dresses and stuff? Oh, not at all. Oh, it was beautiful. My dress was all right because I had an aunt that worked in England and I was the eldest of the grandchildren, and she sent home. The material to make my frock here it was absolutely gorgeous. And there were two old ladies, dressmakers, and they lived in Western Row. And my grandmother brought me there to have my frock made. And it was just below my knee, and it had a mitered edge up and down on it. And she put a bodice on it to match the end of the skirt. Now, it was really beautiful. And boots were coming out that time. But there were only cloth boots here. But my aunt sent me a pair of kid boots from England and my wreath and ale. I got all from England, you know. So are you saying you were the only one with kid boots? Because oh, yes, they were the only one with kid boots, yeah. Actually, the others didn't have boots at all. Because they were a bit expensive, you know. But you see, my aunt sent them from England to me. That's how I got them. I was lucky. Okay. And I'm just wondering, when you were growing up, I mean, how many sisters and brothers did you have? I had two sisters and two brothers. I was the eldest. And, and I, I'm, I'm just trying to imagine then, the eldest often would have quite a significant relationship with our granny and our granddads. What would with my grandmother. I often used to say when I was a kid, I had not much sense that I, I didn't care if my mammy died as long as my granny didn't die. She was so good to me. Now, I'm not saying my mother wasn't good to me too, but I was the eldest grandchild and I was taught an awful lot about, you see. So you were very special to her? Oh, God, yes, I was very special to her. Did you spend a lot of time with your granny? Uh, I did, a good bit of time. For her. I stayed with my mother. I didn't sleep with my grandmother and I slept at home like with the rest. But I'd go up and down. I used to have to cross over the railway and right down along the banks there to it. Up the banks from Coolmine, from the railway cross, and you went up along by the canal bank. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm looking out now onto the, the Clonsailor Road with all the blooming traffic up and down and never stops, never stops. But I mean, so what was it like back then if you were going to take a little trip down to your granny? God's sake, there was only hedges each side of the road. I remember one time when we were living over there, all right, and we were two kids, and there was an unmerciful fall of snow. And there was no shops in Clonsailor Road. There was for a loaf of bread or a, a packet of sweets or a pen of the sweets and that kind of thing. And the butchers was in Blanchestown and didn't myself and my sister decide that we'd walk to Blanchestown to the butchers. Now, we were only kids at the time. And we walked down the road and you couldn't see either side into a field with the mountain of snow that was each side of the road. And we walked through that to Blanchestown and back. It's amazing you didn't get lost in it. That's what I say. My parents took on an awful lot by letting us go. If that snow had to fell down on us, we'd been smothered. But we were lucky. We got there and back. Do you think the weather was maybe different back then? Or it was very hard, the weather, yes. Oh, much harder than now. Oh, God, yes. Very, very bad weather we had. I'm just trying to remember, just from my stories of my own childhood, I, I know my, my grandmother would often talk about, you know, skating on the lakes. That's you know, right, the canal over there. 
And were you able to skate on the canal? On the canal, I don't understand. Is that true? On the canal, it was that bad. It was frozen. No, I didn't do it. I needn't tell you. No, I wouldn't. Because they always dreaded the water. Right. So if nearly been drowned one time, like in Port Marnock, myself and uh, a friend of mine, she was only buried here a fortnight ago. She lived down in Tonsilla, Mrs. Smith. And her husband, Victor was his name, and my late husband, four of us used to go to uh, Port Marnock every Sunday on the bicycles. Now, some of the bicycles would have a mud guard, and the other one wouldn't, and one would have a half a pedal, and the other one would no pedal at all, and we'd pedal off to Port Marnock. And we'd stay that long there that it was over gone past tea time, and we'd be that hungry, we wouldn't have the price of a packet of biscuits, and we'd have to wait till we come home. Honest to God. And that girl that was with us, the other, the chap's girlfriend, she lived in town and I used to bring her home to my place. And my mother used to make a great big curtain cake for Sunday for the tea. And she'd be taking that hot out of the oven. And the two of us would eat it between us. We used to be starving. But this time anyway, we went out and we decided we'd get in to swim. Now, you wouldn't let a fella see you stripping or get down, were sent off down the strand miles away in case they see you. And they and I decided we'd get in for a dip. And we'd uh, suit on a bathing suit we'd down to the knees and up here. Oh, God bless and save us. And God, didn't we get in? And didn't the tide come in while we were out? And the tide came in front of us. And we made our way back. And the more we were coming back, the tide was going up and up and up. Where is it? And they were screaming at us, the two fellas, to come down. Come down. We didn't know what the men. You see, the tide was going around us. Whereas if we had walked on, we'd have had a clear on in. But we didn't. We were very nearly down to the two of us. Mm. So how did you actually get out then? We struggled through the water. We went up to there on us. We struggled through the water, the two of us. And I needn't tell you, we didn't care whether the scene is in their net that time or not. <laughs> 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 oh, that was a very... And I hated the water after that. I don't like it at all. And w- I'm just trying to imagine, was Port Marnock a place where lots of people went out for yes. their Sundays or whatever? Same as ourselves. Same as ourselves. But it wasn't anything like now. It was lovely, Port Man. It was little bushes all along the strand, and you, you sat by the butts of the bushes, and that. it was beautiful. Oh, not right like now. You wouldn't know where you were now in Port Man. Mm, that's true. Was Port Man the kind of places where there was, you know, these little places that you could undress in the privacy? Not all the bushes. In the bushes. You put up the bushes and peel that off, yeah. <laughs> Things have changed, haven't oh, they? Oh, God, they have, yeah. It's yeah. so not but cars go to it now. Right. Women pushing prams. I remember having a pram and my third, you can tell you about the third child that was born. First child was born, we hadn't much money and the pram was a low one, a big handle up here, the hard old thing it was. But anyway, we managed to ride the child. And the second lassie, Colette, she was a villain. She wrecked it, wrecked the pram. And then she was three, a um, couple of months old when I had my first boy. And I said to my husband before the child was born, we didn't know what it was, we'd have to get a pram. I couldn't put the child in that pram. Colette has it wrecked, you know. Oh, no, we couldn't afford it, Lily. But Jeannie, when he came in to see me and he found it was a, a lad, a son, he put his hand in his pocket and he whipped out a bits for the notes. There you are now, Lily, he says to me, you buy your pram for him. And I bought it in Roche stores, paid down for it and all. And I had to walk home with the pram and nothing in it. No way of getting the pram home. So you walked the whole way from town? Walked the whole way to town, from town. But do you know what? I'm wondering whether he had that money. It didn't matter whether it was a boy or a girl. You oh, were going no, to get I that. going to get it. Oh, yeah, I was getting it all right. Well, it wasn't about just the fact no, that it was your first bar. No, no, no. And he was 11 pounds something. Wow, a little horse. Oh, God, he was huge. Yeah. Huge he was. Yeah, he was a lovely boy. And he's still the same. Much taller than I am now, he is. Mm. And, and you're you're a tall lady? I'm very tall, yes. I was over six foot. I was over six foot. But, like, I went down. I suppose with age you do. But I, I'm straight, though. I, I don't... I'm not gone down. Yeah, I, yeah. How come you're so straight? i tell you. When I was a teenager, my father was afraid that I'd get round shoulders or humpy. And he used to get the sweeping brush... This now the sweeping brush, and he put it behind me like that, behind that, behind your head, two arms that way round it, and I had to go back over the brush like that, and walk outside up and down and up and down with the brush, and I was real straight. It was grand then. Then my mother called me the crow, because he used to walk with this. 
You know the way an old crow walks? So here's the crow coming. W- w- with your head held high? Yes, held. I had to. But I, I always appreciate my father for doing that for me. But it sounds like your father must have watched some ballet or something at one stage, because that's what the way the ballet dancers are. He was watching me, watching me anyway. <laughs> and I was very straight, all right. Mm. And, and and so I'm um, just just going back to the, the, your own childhood and just growing up around here. I mean, and you were saying the weather is, the weather was definitely sort of much colder or whatever. And you spent a lot of time with your with your granny. Uh, what about your granddad? Where was he? My granddad on my mother's side was killed. I didn't know him. He was killed before I was born. And my father had a crush on my mother. Mm. And. Of course, you couldn't have on that time. You had a boyfriend years ago, and I was my mother now, and my father. And she was going out with him, all right, behind my granny's back. And it would be in the daytime, wouldn't be the night time, she would be out. And then shortly after that, my grandfather was killed. And my father then came up to my grandmother and asked her, could he help her in any way? And that's how she got to, she loved him. She thought he was a lovely fella. Yeah, she thought he was a lovely fella then. But I'm sure your granny must have told you stories about that time when your granddad died and, and what it was like for the family. It was terrible. She had to go to work in the fields. And uh, I think it's pull turnip, you call it, and snig mangle. There was turnips and mangle. And you snig the mangle and it was on pull the turnips. Pick potatoes and all that she did. She had to, to rear them. She only one son. My Uncle Gilbert, was a lovely fellow he was too. Yeah. How many daughters had she? She had them. Um, my mother, my aunt Liz, my aunt Lena, for five. Right. Yeah. She had six children to try and mind. And right. she had. And my uncle gave my mother away when she was getting married, and he was only seven. Ah. And her seven year old as all he was when she got married. Yeah, that was sad, wasn't it? But there was no such thing as big weddings or anything like that. We had a court and cake at home after the wedding, that was it. It was great. And how many people would turn up at the church? Just the neighbours around, that's all, you know. There was no this of a hundred and oh, people or a hundred and... <laughs> God, street, you hadn't got to feed yourself from going to hundred people. <laughs> Not at all, no such thing as that kind of thing. But I, I know you've said to me, you know, growing up around here and there was no, no, no electricity. No, no electricity, no. There was no electricity around here. The oil lamp, the candle, that's all you had. No sewerage either, nothing like that. No. And how did you manage without sewage? We just tied, drive and tie it, bucket. Right. You knew a bucket outside the back door. <laughs> it was supposed to be a toilet, but the bucket was in and then we built our own little toilet away from the house, but it was still dry for a while. Mm-hmm. And then my, just my husband, I think, was the instigation of getting the sewage for Tonsilla. Wow. It was great. Oh, Lord, we didn't know ourselves. So, so for people who are living here and take it for granted in terms of electricity and sewage around here, they really have to appreciate that a gentleman called Mr. Farnan was the person who actually brought all those modern amenities to the area. He did. And a friend of his as well, another man. Actually, Francis is married to the man's son, but he's dead too. Lee O'Neill. He was a great man too, Lee O'Neill. That was Francis' father-in-law, and he was only he only died here a couple of years. The same day as my ho- same year as my husband, he died. Isn't that extraordinary? I think I told you they emigrated to Australia, and he died in Australia. His ashes are here in Tonsilla, but uh, he died the same year as Danny. Mm, isn't that extraordinary? Wow. Mm, indeed. L- lots of memories. And so I suppose you grew up and uh, you were the eldest, like you said, and you had all your sisters and your, your brothers. And um, and your dad, I mean, was he a man who, who worked and he, did he get work? Oh, he worked in Guinness's, now in the garden. Not like in the um, Porta House, as they call it, just that time. No. So it's not the place beside the river inside in town then? It was them, all right. It was them. Yes. But it was Arthur Guinness. He was one of them. Right. And they had this place down in Den Maroon. And my father worked in the garden, in it, yeah. And and it, that's the school now, is it? The yes, and my daughter-in-law is teaching in that school now. Isn't that extraordinary? And he was the gardener there? Yeah, the gardener in it, yeah. And I'm just wondering, like, there's 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 a lot of land around there. I mean, how, how what kind of work did he have to do? And was he the only one doing it? No, there's three or four men in the garden. Oh, God, no, there's three or four men in the garden. Yeah. They had a little horse and float for going around, cleaning it up and 
carrying around the vegetables and planting and all that kind of thing, you know. Somewhere I have a little photograph somewhere of him and I you know I don't know where it is now, but somewhere in the house. And was he somebody with green fingers or did he ever bring his work home with him or anything like that? Oh, he loved gardening. Love and that garden out there of ours, he dug that from one end to the other with a fork and a spade and planted every kind of a vegetable you could grow on it. We even sold cabbage out of it, put a nose on the gate, cabbage for sale. We made a fortune out of the cabbage for sale. Mm. I, I was very good that way, all right. Then my husband came along and he, he made me a little greenhouse out of plastic, made up a frame in his own mind of a little shed and covered it all over with plastic and bought the tomato plants. I'm years growing tomatoes, years. Mm. And was that an unusual thing in those days to be oh, grown to? Yes, it was. Yeah, the like of us people to grow tomatoes. Oh God, yes, it was. No one, I don't know of anyone around grows tomatoes like that. And had had he got the idea, or your husband? Oh, where did I he got g- the idea? I wanted that. Oh, right. Yeah, I wanted. I'd ask him, "What do you do?" I'd, I'd have a go at it. And when he made it, now we were delighted, and we got the plants then and put them down and grew them and grow. Oh God, I must be 60, 70 years growing tomatoes. Mm-hmm. And say your mam then, your own mother, I mean, your dad was out working. I mean, was was your mother, was she somebody who was like, you know, at home, you know, very diligent woman and taking care of her children? That's right, yeah. Oh, no. See, women didn't work that time. No, no, no. A man married you to keep you, he used to say. I married you to keep you. No, no, no. Woman never worked that time. Sure, I thought I'd never get married, though I wouldn't have to work. <laughs> A little did I know I was in for all the work, but I was doing it for myself. I didn't care. I didn't want to be working for anyone else. And I, I'm, you know, the way say um, you you talk about no electricity, and and I, I'm thinking back in those days, you know, with no electricity and no television, what kind of things did you do in order to keep yourselves occupied at night time? Because to get very dark very early. And no, but it's, it's the lamp, the eye lamp, paraffin eye lamp. Up on the mantelpiece, and a hairpin stuck up in the top of the way the globe wouldn't crack. You know, a hairpin that women used to put in their hair, but we used to stick a, a hairpin down on the globe like that to keep the globe from cracking or breaking or that kind of thing. Take the heat away from it, is that it? Take the heat away from it. And you, you were very lucky you had a double burner. You know what I mean? Another that was a single burner and plenty of old candles knocking around. And you know, there was no fires around that time, isn't it? Candles were dangerous. No. Fires now or anything like that. People were careful, of course, they had to be. Mm. Honest to God, the candles. And what about storytelling? Were you a family who kind of sit around and tell stories or just it didn't really happen? I don't remember ever been telling stories. We were a family that cuddled together at night time, all right, and sat around and children done homework and you know what I mean and went to bed early of course children were always in bed early in bed before eight o'clock at night time when you talk about children what age are you talking about going to school eight nine ten eleven twelve all that age I remember when we come up here to live Richard was only a year and a half that's your son yes the youngest boy and then he went down the years went down the years and I used to have to go out at night at eleven o'clock to get them in off the road and playing football now you couldn't cross the road. Honest to God, playing football on the road all hours of the night. In the summer's even, that'd be, of course. But now you can't even cross the road. Well, things have certainly changed. God, it's changed, is right. And, and, of course, like we said, the electricity has come in. But before that, did you ever hear things that maybe once the electricity came, that was the end of all sort of ghosts and pishogory and all that sort of stuff or did it never really sort of feature in your lives at all? No, you wouldn't think of that kind of thing. No. It was delight to be delight and you showed up on the doors. That was the worst of it. <laughs> <laughs> so so you, you you never had any sort of experiences at all yourself then of, of seeing anything that kind of... Scared me. Oh, well, because I did. I saw scared things all right. One of them was over in my grandmother's was only a young one. And my mother had to get out of the house beyond because, but we're still in Clonsilla, as I say. Um, old Lyman's son was getting married or getting married or whatever when we were put out. And there was no such thing as if you wouldn't be a victor. And you were just flung out on the side of the road and you were paying rent and all. So my father went to live with my Aunt Mary down further down in Cornwall. And my mother went into my grandmother's house in a shed in the back of the house. 
and there was a tin roof on it and they used to have to put waterproof coats over them at night for the drops, you know, the sweat that comes on, on tin dropping down on top of them in the bed at night time. And I used to go around and sit with Mammy at night time for a while, a couple of hours. And Uncle Gilbert had a lovely room like there now, say, and Mother was round the back and I'd come around by Uncle Gilbert's room there and just as I come around to this corner here to come round to where my granny was, her place, this unmerciful big thing come flying round the corner after me, as big as a calf it was. And when I looked round, I thought two big red eyes looked at me. And I went, in, oh, Granny, Granny, I have to see something queer, says I to her. What was it like, she and I told her, that's enough, she said, the sun was going out of it. What do you mean, going out of it? Died. My granny died in a fortnight after. Died suddenly. It was a warning, like, you know. It was a horrible thing, I'll never forget it. Horrible thing it was altogether to see. And was that the only time that you saw anything like yeah, that? Another time there was um, people down in Clonsill, Hillard was the name, they had horses. Right where the lodge is, opposite what the chemist is saying. You know the lodge far side of the road there where all their mouths are there? Well, there was a private driveway up there. And there was a little wicket on the road further up. That you've been in the little wicket, you go in sideways to it. And we used to be on Clonsilla. And actually, this time we were living, we were after getting a house opposite Cunningham's, the undertakers. Two houses there, and we were one down. The all the girls and they used to go out at night and walking down the road and skitting and laughing and that. And we were going up the road this night, and I said to the girls, get off the path quick, look at all the horses, get off the path. And of course they started to laugh at me. I said, please get off, look at all the horses, and pulled them all off the path. There's no horses at all. But I saw the horses, and the men on them and all. It was a funny thing, wasn't it? Mm. It's funny that it was animals that you kept seeing. Yes, animals. I don't know why, yeah. And still I wasn't afraid. Like I, It didn't stop me from going out or that kind of thing. You know, it didn't scare me or anything like that. And then another thing, we lived opposite Cunningham's, as I say. Now, Cunningham's was in their very, very infancy at the time. They had a horse and dray, and they used to go around getting the trees now, at Lushville Town or Shackleton or anyone, there was an old tree gone. And bring home that tree and make the coffins themselves, Cunningham, sit out at the back of the house. And Mr. Cunningham used to get me to go to Fannigan's and Angel Street, there, coffin people too, to bring home the habits and the mountings for coffins and all. And I'd be sitting up on the bus and people would be sitting beside me and didn't that now they were sitting beside somebody with a habit on their knee. I never minded, of course. And I used to love to see anybody going to Cunningham's door and say, Mammy, there's so-and-so going to Cunningham's door, I'll be going for a habit. And he'd give me a couple of coppers for myself and he'd say, God, that was delirious. That was gorgeous now. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. I write money spin around together. Stop it. That was great now. The more the joy, the better for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they used to make their own coffins, old oh, Mr. Cunningham. Right. Yeah, he was a great man too, lovely man he was, Mr. Cunningham, lovely man. And you know the way you mentioned there, Luttrell's Town. I mean, who was living in Luttrell's Town Castle? Uh, one of the Guinnesses where my father walked in. Um, I can think of her name. There was three of them. There was Eileen, Evelyn, and what was she, I think the other one was. And that was Evelyn that lived over there, and she married Brinsley Plunkett. And any time there was a reception of them, whether it be big or small or whatever it was, she always asked my father to it. Because he reared them, the three sisters in the gardens below. They used to live in the garden with him. And anything was on after she got married to Brinsley Plunkett, she always asked my father to it. And used to go? Oh, yeah, but my mother wouldn't go. She used to say, I wouldn't be dressed up enough to go over there. And he was all right, he had a suit of clothes and a collar and tie. You know, I'm not going over there. I wouldn't be dressed up enough. But she'd never have a function in the castle without asking my father. And were they very kind of grandiose affairs? Uh, they were, and they were down to earth too, you know. Mm. And then he was at their weddings as well, excuse me. He was at their weddings as well. Or my age, here in the Protestant Church, Christ Church, I think it was, or my age. He used to be at the weddings and everything. My father made a great fuss of him, no doubt about it. And you mentioned the Shackletons as well. Oh, Shackletons, yeah. Old Mrs Shackleton that lived down there, they built a lovely house for it. And she was belonged to the Senior Assistance Club in Clonsilla with us. Mm, and she was in a wheelchair and she had a car looking after and she came in there. And I tell you what she called me one time. 
Uh, she was awfully grand. She was very grand, she did. And it was almost very great for her to say, hello, Mr. Shackleton, how are you today? Putting it on, you know what I mean? And uh, Mary, my daughter-in-law, was nursing over in Westmanstown. And wasn't Mr. Shackleton in it for a rest, seemingly? And Mary was looking after her, and she said to him, Murray, she says, would you get me my cigarettes? Saying where they were, I don't know where they were. But then Mary went off the cigarettes, and she came back to her, and she said to him, you're from Tonsilla, Mrs. Shackleton? And she said, yes, I am. And I believe you belong to the senior citizens. Is that right? I am, yes. But then you must know my mother-in-law, she says to her. I do. Who is she? She says, uh, Mrs. Fan, and oh, that old battle axe, she said to Mary. Well, Mary took to laugh and she went off and she came back to her and she said, Mrs. Shackleton, I'm not very pleased over you calling my mother a battle axe. She's not one of them. I know she's not. I'm only joking, she says. Was she though? You wouldn't know whether she was or not. I know old battle axe. I never heard that name before, and I heard her saying it. Well, there's a force for everything, isn't there? Yeah, they're battle axe anyway, that's what it's called me. So you left school, and, and your first job, tell me about that. Kitchen maid with Judge Wiley. Ju- Judge Wiley? Judge Wiley, George and Mrs Wiley, yeah. Judge Wiley, he was a judge of the court, and he was a big nice in the RDS. Horses and all that kind of thing, you know. I often course the old faggot when there'd be a hunt on. He used to be master of the ward union hounds. And when there'd be a day out, like, they'd come back up there for tea. And there'd be horses walking around the yard, and there'd be hounds walking around the yard, and the different knows what, and they'd be out for tea there. And you'd have to make the tea? Not actually directly, but I'd have to help. I'd have to help all right, but um, I was six years in it. I done well into a lovely cook, and she was a lovely person. She taught me things now that I would never know, and you know. Where were they originally from? Portersgate. That was Judge Wiley's place. Yeah. That was Judge Wiley's place. And it's a big tree. You know that big tree that is on when you go up yeah. Portersgate? You see it open in the field there. It just have lovely blue flowers around it in the summer. I know it very well. That, I remember that tree. And at the top of that there, well, you go on from that, was the tennis court. Wiley's tennis court, yes. Mm. Wow. And you could know a little bit of it. And there's a magnificent copper beech in Porter's Gate, a beautiful big old tree yes. to the right the of the one you're talking about. That's gone. Yeah. It was rotten. I had to take it down. I saw it all, just only the sump of it kind of there, yes. And around the corner from Porter's Gate then, of course, there's lands that were owned by, is it the Aga Khan or somewhere around there? Was there Ongar Stud or something like that? Ongar Stud is further down to Cluny Road, down towards Cluny, yeah. yeah. And uh, it was different, yeah, Sangsters, I think, or something was the name. Funny name, they were foreigners, I think, that owned it, yeah. Okay. Mm, I wouldn't know them now. But they were all the horse people, actually, the sang. yeah. yeah. Uh, Maxi Arnott now. Yeah, who's that? Maybe it's a big horsey man. Right. Oh, great horsey man, they've done Dunsilla too. Mm. Uh, he used to walk with the stick behind his back, like the way I showed you. Mm. Always walked that, but he was a very tall man. And he had horses nearly every man in Dunsilla, worked for Maxi Arnott, mm. all the grooms and labourers and all, they got great employment. Mm. Was was Clonsilla a very kind of p- posh and proper place? Ah, it was. Oh, God, yes, there was great gentry in Clonsilla. It was lovely gentry in Clonsilla, all right. Mm. But that time there was gentry. There's no gentry now. You know when you say gentry, what, what exactly do you mean? A person that had a high position, such as George Wiley now, and a full staff. Now, they had, um, we started from the kitchen maid, a cook, housemaid, parlour maid, and a butler as well, in the house. Now, that's what you call gentry, full staff like that. Then they had the gardeners and the labourers and all the beautiful outside. Oh, yes. So for anybody living around Clancilla, th- there was plenty of work then? Oh, plenty of work. Plenty of work in it, all right. Maxie Arnold gave great, great work he gave Maxie. Big tall man he was, he never got married or anything. Can still see him walking down the road, and there's a chap still living in Lancilla. Pat Martin is his name. It was Pat and Peter Martin? They were tops too. You know, Mother Mary Martin. Uh, she was a great nun, Mother Mary Martin. You might have heard of her, but she was their aunt. And when they had a nanny, what you used to call them nannies years ago when they were minding kids, and the nanny used to come and pick me up. 
that's not one of ours now. Nanny, you picked me up and we go walking with the two boys in the pram. And it's a real old fashioned pram. It was like a box and little weeny wheels on it down on the ground. And Agnes and I used to go walking with the boys. And Pat Martin is still alive and he's on two sticks. He's terrible bad dark rice. And I often say, I'd love to say it to him. I'd love to say it to him. And I don't get that near to him. He goes to Mass every Saturday night in Portstown. Do you know what? He'd probably love the memory. Oh, sure he would, you know. And I can't pluck up the courage to say it to him. And you're not the shy type now, Elizabeth. No, I'm not really. No, I I don't know how it is. I, I can't pluck up the courage to say it to him. Yeah, but he's a lovely man too. Did you did you send money home? Oh, God, yes, you had to. When I was in Wiley, I was like 30 shins a month. And I got a penny back from Mass for Sunday morning. Because I had a bike used to go to Mass on Porter's Town and I'd get a penny back. You had to get the whole lot away? But the whole lot I had to raise the others, yeah. 30 shillings a month. A month? God, that was dreadful. And a penny for yourself? And a penny got for the month? Mass. That's all I got. And then an old cook told on me. That's how I left Wiley, so I told you about not the cook. Oh, God, no, not at all. And now, housemaid, was in, she knew what faggot she was. She was in Port Marnock. No fact that she was. And he little old witchy old one, you know. I never liked her. And Mrs. Wiley, if the judge went out to dinner, he used to go to dinner and all for that. And Mrs. Wiley would take it into her head, maybe, to do the flowers for the house and that. And I'd always bring her up the can of water. She had a little place, a little room, up off the hall. We were up a couple of little steps. And it kind of a table on it where she'd done the flowers. And a door out of it into the garden where she'd go out and pick the flowers. And she showed me then to bring her up the water, you know. And this night, it was on a Friday, I well remember it. My mother used to go to town every Saturday. And didn't I want to pay? And the cook told me that when I went there, when you're finished up now at night time, she said, Monday, more Wednesday and Friday, you got a half day on a Monday and every second Sunday. That was your time off. But she used to say to me, you could run down as far as your mother on a Wednesday or Friday night and have a chat for an hour or so. So this particular Friday night, which was the truth, I wanted a pair of stockings. And I said to her, oh, yes, you, you can go up, you're all right. She went up down to my mother. And while I was away, did Mrs. Wiley decide to do the flowers and called me for the water. And the other one went up with the water. And she said, Elizabeth's gone out. She told on me. So the next morning, Mrs. Wiley was coming down along the passage. To, they went down to cook, she went down to the cook every morning at 10 o'clock to give the order for the day, for the dinner and the lunch and what have you not got. And uh, she says to me, Elizabeth, she says, when I was looking for you, you were gone out. That's right, says I to her. And she says, but you know, she said, you're not supposed to go. Well, I said, when I came here, you told me I took my orders from the cook. And I asked the cook leave to go down as far as my mother's so I wanted a pair of stockings because she goes to town on a Saturday. And I'm telling the truth, I said, and I'm not ashamed of it. So don't let it happen again, she says to me. So I said, no, it won't happen again. You needn't worry. But it did. I went to Wednesday and Friday just the same. And I let it go for a fortnight, you see. If you gave notice, then you see, say you'd done it in haste, of, you know. So I let it go for a fortnight. So this morning she was coming down to the kitchen. And I said, a big of heart. And I said, my father always told us never to say madam. Never madam or mister anybody. He used to say, there's no madam, so mistress in heaven. And I said, I beg your pardon, I said to her, oh, yes, Elizabeth, she says to me, I said, I want you to take a, a notice from me from today, starting, a fortnight's notice, I said. Well, she looked at me with a bewildered look, and she went into the kitchen, says, look, who can she sat down? I'm shocked, she says to Mrs. Donovan, I'm shocked. She said, what's wrong with you? Elizabeth, that's to give me her notice. I says, Mrs. Donovan, I knew that was coming. I knew that was coming. But why? She said, what happened? Well, she said, and on a, uh, Agnes done a dirty turtle on her the other night. She could have said, told you a lie, and said it was going to bed with a headache or something. She shouldn't have told you. So she said she'll never forgive her, and she wouldn't work any longer with her. But she didn't even want to give me my wages that day. She didn't want me to go. No, she didn't want me to go. Wanted me to stay, stay. I said, no, I wouldn't work any longer with Agnes. That finished me. No, thank you, though, wasn't she? And th- so that was your first job, and it was t- close enough to home. But your second job was, was further away from here? In town, just in place. Yeah, it was Sergeant Heatley. Yeah, he was a lovely man, too, Sergeant Heatley. And herself, of course, the two of them. The two little girls they had. So I lived in. Yeah, I lived in, all right, yeah. What kind of work were you doing? I was taken in as a paramaid. 
and I've done a lot of his work for him as well, like letting in patients, putting them into the waiting room, showing them into the surgery, taking phone calls, making appointments, them kind of things. And part of it as well. Did I ever tell you about the chickens? Oh, God. I think I did tell you about the chickens. When the cook would go out, I'd have to put whatever the bit of meat was or whatever to be, just stick it in the oven and take it out and put it on the dish. And they had what they called a dumb waiter in the kitchen. And you put the stuff in and it pulled her open and it went up into the dining room, you see. But it was a pair of chickens anyway to be roasted and I was put them in the oven. So I put the chickens in the oven all right. It was a, an agar cooker they had. And they were puffing away grand in the oven. I took them out. It was time to bring it up and send it up like to them. They looked after themselves when you sent it up. I took out the chickens. I had a look at them. But God said they were a fine pair of chickens. Mrs. Heatley used to go to the country and buy the chickens and all that. God, they're a fine pair of chickens, no doubt. They were on the dish, ready to go up on the drum waiter. And I thought, oh, sweet Jesus, I just roasted the bloody things with the guts and all in them. Well, I had to get a knife. And saw the bottom out of them and dragged them out and buttoned the hands of myself and pulled the guts out. And then after that, you used to get your supper. And you'd get, like, it's the same supper as them. You finished up what they... Yeah. I'd be like, I know, I would. I ate that bloody chicken. So, so, so Lily, she said, that was beautiful. She says, you roasted them chickens very well. They were lovely, delicious. She said, thank you very much. I couldn't look at her with the laughing. You didn't give them food poisoning, did you? I didn't care what they did or you didn't eat it anyway. It was the truth. I didn't get the right pills, I know they didn't. I dragged it down, buttoned the hands of myself and everything. Didn't know the chickens were dead. But I wouldn't have cleaned them out anyway. No, I wouldn't do that. And the cook forgot to do them, you see. I put them into the dish and all for me. Well, when I told the cook when she came in about me with the chickens roasting the guts in them, she thought it was terrible funny. God, if I had to send them up, jeez, I'd been run out of the place. <laughs> Your mother, I, I would have had a thing or two to say to you. Telling you what, I would, just no doubt about it. And looking back, do you think, you know, moving to the other job, do you think that was a good move on your part? To the, well, it was, yes, it was an experience. It was an experience, yes, it was, it was all right. We had a good old time in it too. Mm. I remember one time, lad, they were very good to us in Heathley's. They'd stay at home for the Christmas Day dinner, all right, and we hash it up to them all. And they always gave us a bottle of champagne with our dinner for Christmas Day. Same as themselves. And this particular day, they went out. They'll always go out then and let you finish up whatever you had to do. And you could do what you like for the evening and then. You could go out to my other place or my mother's and that kind of thing. And we said we'd hurried up and we'd get out. But we didn't we think the bottle of champagne between the two of us. We were stupid and drunk, the two of us. Stupid drunk. And who called only Dr. Merrick? And he was out of Castle Knock on him, but it was the daughter and I couldn't see him. He said, uh, is there something wrong with you? Something wrong with you? I said, I'm after drinking champagne. Oh, it's an excuse for that, he says. Go back and lie down, you'll be all right. Dr. Merrick. So we did go back and we never got out the word day, but we didn't know what champagne was. It was a lovely taste. And the more you drank it, the more you liked it. Ara, what do you mean you didn't know what it was about? At that time, I didn't know what champagne was. But it was a lovely drink. Oh, it was gorgeous. It was, well, we paid for it. Yeah, we didn't get out. Yeah. We were all night then cleaning and tidying up and everything. I'll never forget it. I don't know whether that cook is dead now or not. She was a different cook, of course. That was the cook and surgeon. He was not the shepherd either or not. I'm sure she did. Help her. So, so you, were, you were growing up mm-hmm. and you were approaching your 21st birthday. Oh, God. I was indeed. The day I met me not, the so fella says, at 21, went to a funeral. I told you that. But going to the funeral and seeing these fellas there and got to talking with the lads and all. And he said to me, do you ever go down to the dancing in Blanchardstown? No, I wouldn't be let go. What? You wouldn't be let go? At what age are you? That time you da- I'm 21, so I today. I nearly fell down to the ground. He was 21, I wouldn't be allowed to a dance. Oh, see, that's ridiculous. Go home and ask your parents to let you to the dance tonight. So I crept in and got my knees nearly to my mother to ask her, could I go? Yes, she said, you're home at 10 o'clock. She Christ was only starting at 10 o'clock. So I went to the dance anyway and he left me home. At 10 o'clock? 10 o'clock. Oh, God, I had to I'd be killed if I didn't go. I went home anyway and got in. That was all right. So it started out with that. Then, like, 
I went to work with this place as a toy, Surgeon Heatley's. And I had holidays, it was on holidays this time. And we went to the pictures in, you know, in town. I was at home now in my holidays on my holidays. Didn't we miss the last bus? We saw the last bus crossing over the bridge and we come from the pictures. We know we, what the hell had we do? I'll tell you what he'd do. So we'd take a taxi, he said, and we follow the bus. And when he catch on the bus, he said, we'll get into it. Right, says I. So we did that, and we came on to Blanchardtown. And we had to walk from Blanchardtown then to Mulhudder. I didn't know what to do. Mother left the key in the door, and I opened the door real easy and went in, all oh, real quiet and easy, and up and into the bed. And he got didn't she hear me? And she got out of the bed and come around and... It was a long hall we had, and the end of the hall was our bedroom, and my father's and mother's bedroom was that side. She got out of the bed and come up, and I heard her coming. And I jumped into the bed with all my clothes on me and put it. Thing. See, with no electric light, you see. Are you only coming in at this hour of the night? I know, so I'm in long. Oh, no, somebody else. I know, I'm in long. Oh. No advice like that. Anyway, she went after her. That's all right. I thought you were only coming in at this hour of the night. Oh, I got up and I went and put a match to the candle and didn't a bloody mouse run across the pillow in my bed. I had to sit up all night. I wouldn't get into the bed with a mouse that after being afraid of me living life. So I'd sit up all night. Well, it was good enough for me, wasn't it? For ten lies. Were your parents very strict with you? All parents were strict. No, they're not wet and cruel. They didn't beat you or anything like that. But very straightforward, you know. You'd done what they told you. And that was it. And uh, what would happen if you didn't do what, you, what they told you? Well, you got a bit of a lashing of the tongue, all right, yeah. Oh, yeah, you did do what they were told. You didn't do anything wrong. You were afraid. Oh, God, no. Oh, they were differently raised that time, the children. How oh, much different raised altogether. That's the way. Not like now. And, and tell me, was he your first boyfriend? Oh, God, no. She used to do terrible things on fellas years ago. Make... I had two fellas one time, and she's with the two of them working in the same job, in the time my company it was, and they were both conductors. And this fellow was on early this week, and I had him that night. Another fellow was on early. I just forgot about the two agents working in the same job, and they both talking with the same man. I was a terrible big child to get the young terrible thing. There's, there's names for people like that, you know that. Oh no, and Ginny, my man that I married after. Uh, I said, don't whether I want this fella at all or not. This night I had a date with him. And what did you do? Go out on the road, get into the ditch. And I was down the ditch and he walking by down to the road to meet me. And I in the ditch. And I hopped out of the ditch and went down to Blanche down to the dancing. And left him down the road waiting for me. Oh, I done terrible things. He had great patience with you, hadn't he? God, he had. There's no doubt about it. He had patience with me. Oh, well, sure. But I never done anything wrong now. No, I never done anything wrong. God, no, I didn't do anything wrong. Which, when you say nothing wrong, you mean you were very respectful. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. I was always in good humour. Right. Always in good humour. I never moaned. And up to this day, I wouldn't moan now. No, though I have very bad ulcers and sore legs. And all that. I don't sit down whinging and whining and groaning and moaning. I put up with it. In that kind of a way, what's the use? Just get on with it. Get on with it, yeah. It doesn't get you anywhere. No, it doesn't get you anywhere, I'm on it. But you didn't want to marry this man? No. No, I didn't want him at all. And he proposed to me in the bottom of the ditch. <laughs> Jesus, opposite my other graveyard. <laughs> God, God, what I think of it. And the way he went about it, there's something I want to ask you. No such thing had gone on his knees. I said, what is it? I want you to I know, see, it's very important. What is it? See, will you marry me? <laughs> you must be joking, says I. I'm not going to get married. I don't want to get married. I oh, know that's ridiculous. We're six years going together now. It's time we settle down. But I tell you, I don't want to get married. And my mother must have had her suspicion because it was Sunday afternoon. And he had to go off home. We wouldn't bring him in for tea or anything like that. He'd go off home for his tea. And I went in for my tea. She was standing outside at the gate. When I came up to her, she said, nothing strange today. Yes, so he asked me to marry him. And what did she say? He told me no intention of getting married because she thought he wasn't good enough for me. Now, she liked him all right, but she thought I should have got a fellow with a better job. Do you understand what I mean? But um, my father loved him, though. Oh, my father loved him. So I wouldn't give an answer to him. It kept him on the string for ages before I gave in. And why did you give in then? He was browned off, I wasn't, it was an old cold on me, you know. I was <laughs> going back in it, and he asked me on the bus going in to make up, well, yes, so you will get married, all right. Just in a casual kind of a way, you know. 
So who's that? that I was. Then I got an engagement ring with Tat Apple's gorgeous. Oh, Tat Apple's beautiful. They went to half and every mass and branch turn. I never stopped doing this all the time with my hair. No. Tat Apple's gorgeous. Bloody Egypt, wasn't I? Yeah, and I still have it. I still have it. And did I have no. what, what kind of man was he? He was obviously very patient anyway. Patient, fine, big, tall man. Very, very tall. Over six foot as well. Very tall man. Very straight. And it was very well liked, very, very white. The people at Dunsilla loved him, loved him. And the morning, the night he went to the church in the morning, they brought him right around Dunsilla to pass Dunsilla Hall and stopped outside Dunsilla Hall. As he was wrapped up in the Blooming Hall, he was. Yeah, I loved it, he did. I did. And he was all right, and he was a good husband. Oh, geez, you wouldn't get the like of him now. Brilliant husband, he was brilliant. And you always wanted to be, well, be a few bob that you have something extra for you. And you used to get work hard all the summer down to get in price of books and boots and clothes down for the children for the winter. So he was a really good provider. He was a great provider, he was. He was great. That was a div of that fellow, was. He was an awful hard taking, Richard was. He comes to the back door then, he gets the school back and he gives it a kick and it'll land in there. And out down the road to kick football with the lads, he would. And Gabriel was quite the opposite, the eldest chap. He'd walk in, he'd get maybe a bit of bread or a drink of water or something, and go up and into his room and he'd study, study, study all the time. But then he used to say to me, what are we going to do with that fella? He'd be no bloody good. Uh, what are we going to do with him? He, got, he was the best mechanic. He was the best mechanic like Gabriel. And we went into... Uh, to register him for work when he went to Bolton Street and Gay went to Bolton Street, the boat went to it. And a funny thing, one, the teacher, one of the teachers in it, his brother is married to Richard's sister now. They live down in Dunshockland. Gabriel Daly was his name. And um, the two of them went to Bolton Street and done very well. And he got the option of ha anything he wanted. He got the option that he wanted nothing to be a mechanic, a mechanic, a mechanic. So that's what he's at. He works on natural trucks up there in the new place up there. Um, up in Mulhudders, they have a big place up there now. How many children did yourself and Dennis have? Six. Four girls and two boys. Mm, four girls and two boys. Mm. All married now. And, and in those days, I mean, did you ever get out of the house? Did you ever get to ha do anything except sort of cooking and minding? Yes, yes we did. We used to build circuses. We used to go around the circus down the road, you know. Or oh, did anybody put the rent man one day? Oh, jeez, I think I did tell you about the rent man. Mrs. Carty was down in Blanchardstown. She used to deal down in a little shop at the end of the road. They used to call it the Forge. And she had a weekly book, and she got her messages weekly and then paid for them like Friday night, you know. Then you never were short, you could run and get out during the week. She come in this day to me, and the children were small at the time. Hey, Fran, and she, there's a bloody old fella going around collecting, she, with that old gay lane. I don't know whether you ever heard of gay lane, but that old gay lane, she, she, the hell with them, we won't answer them. They're not, you them old fellas. No, so like we won't. So she come in here to me. I don't know where her kids were. They weren't over there anyway. And we got down there on the floor under the window, and here he come in the gate and the bundle and his hand and this old fecker, I'd say to her. Opened the gate, he didn't walk. No, there was no gate, we told gate our pail, and he walked straight in, knock, knock at the door. And every time he knocked, I gave an expression. Every time he knocked, he a very polite expression. Oh, a lovely one. He walked down, he looked in the window, and all to see we were there. No, no, he was there. And I'm shoving his fist down the kid's mouth in case I make noise, you know. The next thing he went round to the back door, knocked at the back door, uh, my expressions again, of course. So he went out the gate, he kept looking back and looking back like this, you know, just looking on around. And he went off. And the old kitty old lady we hated her, the woman that lives in the top house up there, she's getting up there. The contrary old fecker she is. But anyway, we went out into the yard and she walked out, it was only a paling along there now. And she said, what did you think of the new rent man today? And I looked at Cat, yes, I was all right. It struck me immediately, it was the rent man, you see. Well, when she went in, we lay in the yard laughing the two of us over the rent man. He came back again. I was here before, he said, looking for you. I just couldn't find I said it was over the school collecting the children. And I under the window looking at him. Thinking he was the gay man. He was the bloody gay fella, that's the truth. 
and he wasn't if he's the rent man. And weren't you involved in um, a women's club or a ladies' club, should I say, in Clansilla? Yeah, we organised it with myself and another woman down the road, Mrs O'Neill. We organised the ladies' club and we started in her house. She had the post office, she took the post office, and we started there. Oh, God, we had great times there, great times. <laughs> There was a little woman used to go, Mrs. Kelly was her name, and she used to go, Winnie was her name, and she was a nice poor old crate, I was very fond of her, but she was real small, like, didn't grow or that, but she was married now to Joe Kelly, a nice man too, and there only one daughter, but we used to go down there anyway, and Mrs. O'Neill's daughter was going with a fella by the name of Cannon, or Cannon, yeah, Cannon was his name, and they didn't want him, they hated him, O'Neill's did, but was she parked outside in front of the house, in off the road, like, and she was with the fella. We all come out, Mrs. Carty and Winnie and I, a few of us come out onto the road together. And we're talking, didn't Winnie let a big blow fart? Now, in other words, oh, Jesus, Winnie, so you're rotten. The bloody fart is bigger than you are. Well, Carty lay on the road, Mrs. Carty, on the side of the road, and she couldn't get up. Oh, oh we laughed over that night. And the sides of Winnie, oh, no, it was dreadful. And we'd walk now from down near the graveyard down there it was, walk back up to here. We couldn't walk up there over the laugh and though we had great fun together. And there was no circus used to come down here to because there were no houses down in McDonald's Field. And uh, we caught we not the price of the bloody circus. And I'd say to Jenny, got a great old circus down the road, I'd love to go to it. Have you the price of it now? Well if you go up to me old pocket you might get something in it. I go up to the pocket and I get the price for the two of us. But she'd give it back to you, Mrs. Carty, over the weekend. She was great that way, though. If you helped her out at all, she was great for coming back with it to you. Oh, them were the times. Oh, they were the times. But I suppose just from talking to you previously, um, you were avoiding the gay lean man in inverted commas. But you've also invited the tax men once or twice. Tell me about your trip up to Belfast. Oh, Jesus, stop it. We used to go to Belfast, hire a bus and go. It was very cheap to go. And cheap. Oh, the living in Belfast was much cheaper as well. And I used to go and buy an awful lot of stuff for the kids here. Dresses for the girls and pants for the boys. Loads of stuff. Because you get it for little or nothing, you know. But you had to tax it. You know that thing? You had to pay for a, a tax. Or what did they call them when they went round the tray and... Um, Customs, isn't customs. it? Customs. Now I have it. Yeah, I have the customs. Yeah, I have it now. And I said, well, I'm not bloody well paying on all this stuff now to hell with it. I'm not. What did I do? And I shoved it. We wore a bloody big knickers. That time with elastic in the, there and elastic up. I can still see the pink knickers and blue knickers. They were more like bloomers, oh, weren't they? Bloomers. <laughs> bloody big things anyway. <laughs> but didn't I stuff all my stuff into me knickers, into the bloomers, as you say? Stuffed on the women were in stitches laughing. And I said, to fuck am I not going to pay for them anyway? So I was sitting there and he went in, and it's there, and it's there, and he kept, and it's there. And all the women say no, and he comes to me, and it's there, no. Are you sure? Yes. Do you want to look at me knickers? So I to him, like that. And all he could do was walk out laughing. I mean, knickers stuffed with the bloody things. You're right, cheeky young one, oh, so you are. Stop it. The women, I nearly killed them that day. You want to look on me knickers, as I told Oh, we great fun, though, going to Belfast. You used to love going to Belfast. Things were so cheap. Mm. You've had a long life and many, many more years ahead of you, no doubt, just from your energy. What would you say to somebody who is, you know, a younger person, if you were saying, you know, this is the way you should live your life if you want to live to be a ripe old age? Eat. Drink. Sleep, exercise, and don't worry. Don't worry. No. I worried once, and it was over Mrs. Carty dying beyond, and I got delayed shock three months after she died, and I ended up in hospital. And I swore that's what was over, worry. I was delayed shock, that's worry. But uh, uh, don't ever worry. And uh, help everyone as much as ever you can. Always share. That's a great thing to share with anyone. And uh, love your friends and love your neighbours. Don't do wrong on anyone. And always be pleasant, you know what I mean? That's the way I go on anyway. And it's a good life. 
Elizabeth Farnan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for talking to me. Thank you so much for listening to me. And just before we finish, we're going to um, ask uh, Elizabeth to sing us a song. Elizabeth, tell me, what song are you going to sing and why is it your favourite? I don't know. I always took a liking to the Rose of Dralee. I love that song and I love to hear anyone singing it. But my voice is nearly gone anyway. How and ever, thank you. We'll give it a lash. Over to you now, Elizabeth. The pale moon was rising above the green mountain. The sun was declining beneath the blue sea. When I strayed with my love to the pure crystal fountain that stands in the beautiful vale of Tralee.